Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Faith and Friends. Uh, so glad to have you joining us this evening as we continue working our way through the book of John. Uh, so just a few things before we get started. Uh, I do want to let everyone know that we are going to be kind of kicking off all of our youth programs in the next week. Uh, so starting this Sunday, we will be having our confirmation, uh, and that's for 7th and 8th graders. That'll be happening right after the second service, so noon to 1. We're also going to be having our Youth Sunday School. That'll be between our two services, so about 9.15 to 10.15 uh, at the church. And then also on Sunday evening, we are going to have our first, uh, well, in-person Faith and Friends of the Year. Uh, and for that, we're actually going to be meeting at uh, the Buckman's house, and that is just for high schoolers. So if there's any high schoolers out there that want some more information on that, let me know. Um, yeah, and then I guess the last thing that we've got going on is our middle school youth group, and that will be meeting uh, here at the church on Wednesday evenings from uh, 7 to 8. So if you're a middle schooler out there that wants to be a part of that, let me know, or you can just show up. Uh, again, that's uh, Wednesday evening, 7 to 8. So and that's for 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. So uh, yeah, I'm just really excited to kind of kick off all of our programs. Um, you know, we've already done a little bit to kind of meet the kids and get them involved. And so I'm excited as to where we're going to go from here. And uh, I know we're kind of in a weird time, but thankfully we have a a church with plenty of space so we can still meet in person and spread out and, and do some of these things safely in person because, you know, we just think there's great value in, you know, people being, being able to, to come together and not just do everything virtually. So, uh, yeah, all those are kind of listed on our website if you want to check those out um, or get a hold of the church or me if you need any more details on those. So, uh, yeah, just excited to get a lot of those things started. Uh, so with that, why don't we uh, jump into our study for tonight uh, and start this evening with a prayer. So uh, please pray with me. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would just uh, teach us from it this evening as we uh, look into this, the story of your resurrection and the great gift that it is to us. In your name, amen. So if you joined us last week, uh, you'll know that we kind of finished with, well, the death and burial of Jesus. That's where we left off. Um, and so now we get to dig into, well, the good news, the, uh, the joy that comes after that, that we, well, that you are hopefully aware of. And if not, well, this will be an exciting, exciting lesson for you. Um, so let's jump in. This is again, John chapter 20, uh, starting at verse one. So if you've got a Bible, uh, I'd encourage you to open it up so you can follow along with us as we read. Um, the version I have is the New International Version, so if you have a different version, it might read a little differently, but uh, yeah, feel free to follow along. So John chapter 20, it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So, the, you know, the last we heard from any of Jesus' disciples was about his death and his burial. And so Mary, uh, early, first day of the week, that being Sunday, that's the, the first day of the week that they're talking about, comes to the tomb expecting to find a body. And it is surprised to find the tomb empty. And uh, obviously it's not empty in the sense that we understand it. She's... She sees the empty tomb, but it doesn't bring her joy. It brings her anxiety, worry. You know, she's wondering where did they, where did they take Jesus's body? So she runs back to the disciples to tell them. And uh, you'll notice also that she says, we don't know where they have put him. Um, this implies that she was not alone. And we see in the other gospels that there were indeed other women that had went to the tomb with her. So uh, verse three. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there. So Mary returns to the disciples, tells them what she's seen, and two of them take off running to the tomb. 
Uh, again, we know the other disciple listed here to be John. And, you know, it tells us that John outruns Peter. And uh, a <laughs> little bit of a brag there. But the reality was that it's why to believe that John was the youngest of the disciples. So, you know, it just kind of made sense that he was a little bit faster. But but when he gets there, he's he's hesitant. You know, he stops at the, the door of the tomb. And uh, Peter, uh, always being bold, just walks right in. You know, he wants to know what has happened. Um, it says what it says. It says, he saw the strips of linen lying there. In verse 7, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first went, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Uh, so a couple of notes here. They see the the grave clothes, the, the cloth that Jesus would have been wrapped in, uh, but it's all folded up. And, and, you know, I think this is kind of interesting, the fact that, you know, Jesus, when he rose from the dead in a little way, uh, in a way, is kind of took the time to make his bed. And uh, it also kind of alludes to the fact that Jesus was not indeed stolen. You know, if you read out there about theories about what actually happened and why Jesus didn't ride, rise from the dead, you know, one of, one of the theories is his body was stolen. And it seems odd that robbers would take the time to fold the clothes he was wearing, let alone take them off. Um, so just another little sign that points to the authenticity of, of what this story is telling us. Um, and then in verse 8, we see... Uh, it says, uh, speaking of the other disciple, he saw and believed, and they still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So I think it's kind of obvious that what it's saying he believed here is that he believed Mary. He believed that Jesus was gone. It's not saying that he believed everything that Jesus had told him and understood it, because it plainly says that he does not. But the disciples believe what Mary had said, that Jesus was not there. Verse 10, then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? So suddenly these angels appear and we don't necessarily know what alerted Mary to their presence, but they are well, they're gentle with Mary. You know, they, they understand what is happening. The angels know that Jesus has risen from the dead. And so they simply ask her a question. Why are you crying? And she replies, They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. So, you know, she tells them why she's upset, that Jesus is gone. And she turns around and it tells us that she sees Jesus there but doesn't recognize him. And this is kind of kind of interesting, kind of hard to understand. You know, she had spent years following Jesus around, providing for him. It seems odd that she wouldn't recognize him. But I think there's probably a few ways this could be explained. One, she didn't expect to see him. You know, I think there's a lot that our, our minds can change when it's just completely unexpected to us. Uh, two, it tells us it was early. It could have just still been dark and she couldn't see him. Uh, or three, Jesus could have just kind of hid his face in some way. Uh, maybe it's a combination of these things, but no matter the reason, she didn't realize it was Jesus. And Jesus says to her, Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. So all Jesus has to do is speak her name. And she realizes who it is. Uh, we saw earlier, I think it was uh, in John chapter 10, Jesus says, you know, I call my sheep by name and they know my voice. Jesus, in speaking Mary's name, she knows his voice. She knows who it is. Verse 17, Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. 
And here we see uh, what has changed and what Jesus says to her. Jesus says that he is going to his father and he calls his, the disciples his brothers and refers to God as both his father and our father. You know, God was Jesus' father by nature. And now God is also our father through the sacrifice that he has gone through. Through his death, we have become brothers of Jesus, sons of God the Father, and heirs to his kingdom. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. We see here Mary is really the the first apostle to the other apostles. You know, the word the word apostle just means messenger. And here we see that Mary is the first person to have the opportunity to share this good news, to share the good news of Jesus' resurrection with other people. Verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. So this is just just later that day. It says the evening of that day. Jesus comes and, you know, in his miraculous way, suddenly appears among them. He tells us they were hiding because... Well, the disciples had seen what they had done to Jesus, and they didn't want any part of that. And Jesus' first words to them are, Peace be with you. And we have to remember how the disciples had last left Jesus. They had, you know, ran away from him when they saw the trouble coming. You know, Peter had denied who Jesus was. You know, they were probably kind of sitting there in their shame and their disgust with themselves. And Jesus comes and wants to wipe all that away immediately. His first words, peace be with you. He wants them to to have peace. You know, he understands what they have been through. Verse 21, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you for not, do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So Jesus brings them his peace and then he gives them a task. He says he is sending them out just as Jesus was sent to share God's news with us. The disciples and us are sent out to do the same. And he also gives them a gift. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. And if you're familiar with uh, the Bible, you'll know that uh, in the book of Acts, we really, we, we have, we celebrate what is called Pentecost, which we kind of mark as the official sending of the Holy Spirit. Um, But what we see here is that the Holy Spirit is received before then. And the Holy Spirit is really a continual gift to us that enables us to have faith, that enables us to carry out Jesus' call for us to be sent out and spread the good news. Verse 24. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the, other disciples, so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails are and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. You know, we see Thomas here. Um, well, he's known as Doubting Thomas for a reason. He He just can't come to believe that this is true. Um, And we see shortly that Jesus changes that. Verse 26, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. So we see that Jesus comes back A week later, the next Sunday, you know, in some ways we we see Jesus establishing a pattern that we still hold to today in meeting and worshiping every Sunday. And he comes back and again, he he starts with the greeting of peace be with you. Um, And if you're familiar with our, uh, and this kind of welcomes his presence. And if you're at all familiar with how we 
do our service here at, at Faith, we, we have an order of service that is similar every week. Um, and every week before we have communion, before we distribute the bread and the wine that is Jesus' body and blood, a pastor says, the peace of the Lord be with you all. And we reply, and also with you. Jesus' peace precedes his coming here and it's something that we remember every week in communion. And so he says to Thomas, you know, here's your opportunity. This is what you wanted to be able to touch me, to see that I am who I am, that I am Jesus, that I have these holes in my hands and these holes in my side. Verse 28, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. What's kind of interesting here is we see that it does not say that Thomas actually touched Jesus. I mean, I have to imagine that he did. You know, I can't imagine Jesus showing up and providing this opportunity and Thomas being like, well, no, I don't, I don't need to now. Uh, but Thomas does proclaim who Jesus is, his Lord and his God. And verse 29, then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And this is a call to all future Christians to come. You know, we will not see Jesus in the flesh in this world, but it tells us that we are blessed by believing through the word of God, through the word of the prophets, through the words that are written down, that our belief blesses us, our faith blesses us. Verse 30. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So here, the author, John, lets us know that there's a lot of other stuff Jesus did that, you know, I'm just not going to tell you about. But he also shows us the reason that he is writing says that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. That is why he has written this gospel, why he gives us these words, so that we too can go forth confessing what Thomas confessed, that Jesus is our Lord and our God. That's the end of verse 20, and, and honestly, it seems like kind of a good end to the book of John, but there is, there is in fact one more chapter um, that we'll, we'll finish up with next week. So, uh, I want to thank you for joining me tonight. Uh, thank you for, for tuning in as we look into God's word. And I uh, look forward to our final chapter next week. And I'll hope you join us then. So have a good night, everyone. Bye.